So today we are shifting our focus to the war in the Pacific. The United States have been fighting on two fronts. Um, in Europe, they were fighting Germany, primarily with Great Britain and um, the Soviet Union. And then we were also fighting Japan on the our Pacific side. So our objectives today is students will be able to identify, discuss, and analyze the major events of World War II in the Pacific and identify the temporal structure of a historical narrative. Our essential question is what military strategies did the United States pursue to defeat the Axis powers in World War II? So today is all about um, analyzing photographs. We are going to look at some key moments on the Pacific side. Uh, there is This is an extensive history of battles here that were hard fought uh, for very small amounts of land and unfortunately we can't highlight all of them, but we are going to spend the day looking at photos from key events through the war. After you look at the photo, um, there's a brief description of what you what the photo represents afterwards. So the first thing um, on your handout you will see is this chart and what I, we, I want you to do is you're going to look at the photo that's provided in these slides on your handout it tells you exactly what slide the photo is on and then you're just going to tell me what you see so without having any context or historical background I just want you to acknowledge what you are seeing in these photographs and then then um, so again this is photograph one you will be looking at this photograph. Sorry, I didn't mean for that start. So you'll be looking at the photograph and then writing in your chart what you see. And now this information, I'm just gonna go ahead and hide my camera here so I'm out of the way. This information is about this photograph. So this is a the photograph titled American Surrender to Japanese at Bataan, April 9th, 1942. So this area, the Patan Peninsula, the American and Filipino soldiers were able to hold for four months. And they thought that if it, they could just keep holding on, that U.S. ships would bring reinforcements, more men, food, medical supplies, ammunition, everything they needed to like make this last run and try to defeat the Japanese. However, so many ships had, were still in recovery from the attacks at Pearl Harbor, there was no one that could come in. And the Japanese had pretty much blockade and were attacking every ship coming in. So when they ran out of food and medical supplies, there was <coughs> only about half of their troops were um, combat effective, or, which at that time meant you could walk to an area to kind of lay down and fire your weapon, whether that was effectively or not. And then, so on April 9th, 1942, they surrender. The combined forces equaled about 70,000 people. And what happened after this was the Japanese uh, took all of the men, who surrendered, who were very weak. Many were already sick. They had sick. They were very, had malnutrition, um, suffering from other diseases, and they grouped them up and made them march to their own prison, uh, prisoner of war camp. And this was 65 miles. It is estimated that about 7,000 to 10,000 were killed along the way, but the Japanese did not keep records, so it's hard to say. This has been become known as a death march, as many people that took part in this died. Life in the prisoner camp was not much better as those who lived there. There was on average that about 400 were killed by the Japanese a day. So this is our next photograph. This photograph, um, you are going to go back to your chart, look at number two, and then tell me what you see here. So what you're actually seeing here is what becomes known as the Doolittle Raids on April 18th, 1942. This is where the Army and the Navy work together and do something that had never been done before. They are going to use these aircraft carriers, the ones that were not damaged in Pearl Harbor, and they're going to transport B-25s, which were airplanes. They were going to have 17 of them on this ship, and they were going to head towards Tokyo. Now, these planes had to be altered a lot because the runways on these aircraft carriers were very short. So the planes had to become extremely light, but they also had to carry enough fuel to get them to Tokyo. So we had to strip the planes of any unnecessary island um, items. The planes had to be very light to get off the short runway of the ship, which had never been done before. And then we needed to provide that extra fuel and, you know, account for that weight as well. 
Now, the people that went on this mission, it was widely known that they would not have enough fuel to get back to the ships. Plus, landing on a ship had not been done at that time. And so what they were told was that they would try need to try to get to China and not get caught by the Japanese that had occupied those areas and try to find friendly people. So there were 17 aircrafts that went. Their key tar they were looking for key industrial or military targets in Tokyo. One of these aircrafts crashed into a Japanese ship, 15 crashed in occupied Japan, and one was actually actually landed in Soviet Union. So this did little actual damage to Tokyo, but what it did was it put fear in the Japanese civilians and just fear in Japan in general that the United States could and would reach the mainland. This is photograph number three. So again, on your chart, you will t just talk about what you are seeing here. Now we are not going to address a lot of details here because we're going to do a whole lesson on this, but what you're seeing in that photo is the first Navajo code talker sworn into the Marines on May 4th, 1942. So the Marines, um, recruited uh, Native American people who were fluent in their traditional tribal language and English. So they would use this traditional tribal language to send secret allied messages. It, while we're focusing on the Navajo here, there were actually 14 nations represented in Europe and the Pacific. They developed and memorized a unique military code using, using unwritten language. And like I said, on Thursday, we are gonna spend more time uh, talking about the code talkers. In photograph number four, you fill that out on your chart about what you're seeing here. So this is the Battle of Midway, June 4th to the 7th in 1942, and one of the first victories the United States um, have in the Pacific. So on June 4th, four Japanese aircraft carriers arrive at Midway, and their aircraft leave the ships and they start attacking the U.S. base that is already there because the Japanese, their true goal was they wanted to rid any American presence within the Pacific Islands. What they didn't know was east of the island, the U.S. fleet were there waiting for them because they had cracked a code that had been sent between Japan, letting us know, um, well, Japan didn't want to, but we were able to figure out where they were going to attack. And that was Midway. So the U.S. fleet was able to attack and damage, extremely damage, all four Japanese character uh, carriers, the Japanese at the sea and the ground troops. They um, were suffering great losses and they were forced to surrender. This was a crucial victory for um, the United States. It stopped the Japan growth and started sending them into a shrinking empire. And then the United States, as we started, we were on the offense at this point, started island hopping. And this is where they, we would jump and do quick battles on all these um, different small islands throughout the region, gaining military bases and securing them. And this is our last photo here. So you will go to the last space on your chart, fill out what you are seeing. Every time. Okay, so this is the Battle of Iwo Jima. Now, this photograph was taken on February 23rd, 1945. The Marines invaded Iwo Jima on February 19th of that same year. There were 70,000 U.S. troops to 18,000 Japanese. There were 36 days of actual fighting. This was the bloodiest battle in Marine history. And by March 26th, the island was finally secured, but at great loss to both sides. Now, this photograph is really important um, because this happened, you know, not on the 23rd, just a few days into the battle. And some Marines had managed to be able to cl um, climb atop one of the mountains on the island and raise this flag. And the photographer that went up there with them snapped this photo and it became iconic. These men in this photograph were circulated all over the world. These men started traveling on war bond tours. And this photo has become so iconic that it was the um, photo that was used for one of the World War II monuments in Washington, DC. You can visit this monument. Um, today. It was a symbol of valor, valor and unity. So here's what we're going to do for this, your independent activity. Your scenario, you're going to have to really pretend here. You are running the official World War II Pacific Theater Twitter account. You are going to write a Twitter post for each photo, so 140 characters or less. So five photos, five posts. The post should highlight the event not describe what you see in the photo, okay? Because now after every photo, I have given you some background information. And so the 
post should be highlighting the event and not describing the photo. Please keep that in mind. So this is what your independent activity chart looks like. You have your photo. I told you what slide they were on. And then you will just type your Twitter post in there. Remember, just like Twitter, I'm going to cut you off in my grading at 140 characters. Okay, so keep it concise and make sure you're explaining the event and not describing the photo. Please let me know if you have any questions.